Hello, and welcome to Oakville Matters. Thanks to your TV, this is our chance to talk about the things that matter most to Oakville residents. And as we saw over the last year or more, saving the farmland in Halton does matter to our residents. We had an unprecedented outpouring of emails and delegations and uh, submissions as we went through the uh, process of uh, adjusting our official plan at the regional level to uh, fit with the province's changes to its growth plan. And with us today to talk about what we did, how we did it, and what it means for the future is Kurt Benson, who's the planning director of the region of Halton, and Jane Fogel, who's a town and regional counselor and spearhead of the Save Farmland movement uh, in Halton. Uh, and uh, did I remember to say Halton Hills, Jane? And uh, Jane lives uh, in a internet challenged area, so she may freeze from time to time, but we'll just work around that because it's, it's uh, important to hear from her and her leadership on this. And we're also joined by the leader of environmental defense, uh, which is uh, Tim Gray. And uh, environmental defense had a little bit to do with this too. And so, Let's let's um, establish that first. Um, Tim, you want to talk about uh, environmental defense's campaign to save farmland and, uh, you know, in the what's called, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the conformity to the growth plan exercise that the regions have and single tier cities have just been through. Tim, uh, how did you do with your campaign? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Mayor Burton. Yeah, this, uh, this effort, I think, is uh, broadly part of our what we call our Livable Communities Program, you know, which aims to ensure that uh, we develop our cities in a way where they're uh, transit-friendly, people can move uh, across their cities by walking or bicycle or public transit to the greatest degree possible, that we build uh, affordable housing that is proximate to the services that people need, um, that's affordable, um, that's climate friendly. And uh, the sprawling model we've had for suburban development throughout the Greater Golden Horseshoe since about the Second World War is sort of the antithesis of that approach to thinking about our future. So uh, a big part of that, of course, is uh, uh, creating these urban spaces that I think we would all like to live in but it's also about protecting the lands outside of our cities permanently so that they are uh, able to grow food, that they're able to provide water and oxygen and wildlife habitat, and uh, that we have a future that we can see that is sustainable into the future. And when we went into this uh, exercise throughout the region, each of the, the five regions uh, being required to develop a new official plan, uh, we knew that uh, there were many, many people in each of these regions that really wanted to see a future that was more sustainable. And, and key to that, and probably the top line message for many is uh, just what's happening at those boundary limits. Are the cities expanding massively onto farmland and the natural areas? Or are they trying to meet their development needs, housing people, creating new businesses uh, within side of their existing boundaries? And so we were very much pushing for for that approach uh, to limit um, the sprawl of cities onto farmland. And uh, you know, it's, it's really great news to see that, that Halton has made the decision to not expand its urban boundaries at all for the next 30 years. And uh, also to see that also uh, occur in, in Hamilton, also very good news. And, and the people of the regions really drove this. And uh, I'm really happy to see that that's happened and to see that councils uh, listened and um, that that's where we're gonna be going, hopefully, uh, assuming the province uh, approves these plans. Well, we think, uh, speaking for myself as a member of council, uh, we thought our plan uh, meets the province's needs and requirements. And uh, so uh, I join you in hoping that they, uh, they let us, you know, the theory that, that we bring to the table is we accept that we, must grow. We even want to, but we'd like to do it our way. Thank you very much. And uh, and our way is going to involve far more intensification, growing up rather than out. And Jane, if your internet isn't frozen, I can see you moving, so I know you're not. Uh, can you talk about how the grassroots got lit? Because uh, we've never had so many thousands of emails as uh, as we received on this. Uh, yeah. Well, it. 
there really was a symbiotic relationship with the city of Hamilton, if people aren't aware of it, that, that first we started with our delay motion and they picked that up and suddenly they had Stop Sprawl Hamont uh, running. Uh, and with their success, we it, they came back to help us in, in uh, Halt and do the same thing. And what it really was, was engaging the public at a new level than they'd ever been involved before. Um, it, there, there was no actual group or given leader. The, it was uh, kind of a horizontal organization that welcomed people in and gave them ways to be engaged that they hadn't had before, uh, including coming to a weekly meeting. Uh, like we normally 35 people would show up on Tuesdays for those meetings. They did fundraising uh, so that they could have a coach to, to help them with this. Uh, they use technology to, um, you know, end up with, say, a thousand emails in a, in a councillor or a mayor's uh, inbox. Uh, the, and, and, of course, a thousand lawn signs uh, with a whole troop of people that would put them out in the different municipalities and, and continue to involve them with regular communications so that, in my mind anyway, councillors and mayors would realize that people really believed in what they were saying and were going to continue to watch and demand a different uh, end result. Uh, and this varies from the norm where we would do a public engagement session. Uh, people would talk and then it would be recorded somewhere and maybe summarized and later given to, to councillors who might not read it. But in this case, uh, we all knew they were watching and we had to attention to them uh, as much as we paid attention to anything else and it worked well and and your internet held for almost all of that but i think we got what you said because it did work and uh talk about the emails i think i had 2000 so uh i've i've never had so many uh uh i, I never had so many friends um <laughs> Uh, but Mr. Benson, Mr. Planning Director, Kurt, um, some wise guys uh, afterwards are saying, oh, but it won't work. The, the two most cited uh, sort of wise guy isms are, well, the province will just overrule you. Uh, and the other one is, well, but uh, in 2041, you'll reopen it and, uh, and uh, blow it out. Uh, now, I personally, uh, I remember speaking at the council meeting that we passed it. I, I think you've come up with policies to guide that post-2041 exercise that are going to uh, serve us very well and continue to preserve farmland. But in reverse order, could you speak to those two things, like uh, a little bit about the policies, uh, uh, what the thinking is about how that'll work for 41, and, uh, and, uh, and then, you know, what do you think about uh, the prospects of the province leaving us to do a made in Halton solution? Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you for having me, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the province requires all upper tier municipalities in the in the Golden Horseshoe to do these uh, growth planning exercises, and and fundamentally, they require us to allocate or. Uh, assign uh, population and Halton's population we have to meet by 2051 is 1.1 million people. Um, we have to come up with uh, a plan to, to, to allocate that population. And I think through the public engagement process, we heard very loudly that, um, you know, the public wants uh, uh, different uh, alternatives uh, for growth uh, and intensification. And, and um, we certainly heard loud and clear that, uh, you know, farmland uh, in Halton is important uh, to protect, and and so what we what we did, recognizing that we are we are still mandated to follow the rules of the province that they lay out uh, under the growth plan. We have to do something called a a land needs assessment uh, to determine the amount of new land. Uh, it's a very uh, rigid kind of calculation uh, that we do. And as a part of that assessment, um, we did uh, identify that we, you know, you, according to the province's rules and methodology, uh, we do require um, uh, upwards of, of 3,000 hectares of, of, uh, of additional land. Uh, now, um, but we also recognized, and um, through the feedback and direction of council, that we do have 
uh, enough existing designated urban land uh, to get us to 2041. So um, we went back and we looked at how how can uh, how can we devise a policy that allows us to really understand and take stock in the changing attitudes with respect to uh, intensification and and uh, providing more density along along transit routes we know that uh, there are many many projects that are coming in right now within the existing urban uh, you know designations in the op um, that are really good intensification projects um, more and more these pro- uh, proposals are coming forward and uh, we felt it was important that uh, council have an opportunity to take stock in what's happening and and to monitor it um, to determine you know can we in fact meet uh, our long term uh, population growth needs uh, through intensification so um, the um, ROPA 49 what we call it uh, ROPA is Regional Official Plan Amendment uh, 49 uh, devises uh, uh, a growth plan that sees no growth uh, or no urban expansion uh, to 2041 but sometime but be- uh, between now and 2041 we will be looking at you know based on an enhanced monitoring uh, plan that looks at things like how how we are densifying in our communities, how we are advancing uh, intensification proposals. You know, can we indeed, uh, you know, meet our population uh, growth goals, um, you know, within the existing urban boundary? And so um, we feel um, as a, as a matter of principle, it's, it's uh, important to ensure that council has the best information uh, when uh, making decisions, especially decisions that have uh, significant long-term implications like, you know, expanding urban boundaries. So um, so the uh, ROPA 49 does uh, have an enhanced monitoring framework where we will be reporting annually to council on how those policies are performing in, in an effort to, to allow council to, to make a determination uh, in the future about, you know, can we um, persist with this approach um, of uh, contained urban boundaries or, or do we need to look uh, at other alternatives? Well, and and just uh, the other day, a couple of days ago, you issued the annual state of housing report for the region. And uh, I couldn't help but notice that Oakville has uh, achieved all of its overachieved its targets, uh, according to that report. And um, and for that matter, our planning staff here at the local municipal level did provide the region with a report saying that Oakville could could accommodate all of the growth assigned to Halton for the, uh, the time horizon out to 2051. So you do have, uh, in addition to your policy of monitoring, you've got some pretty good evidence there uh, of capacity. And, uh, and I'm hoping that the proof of capacity will argue against the prob- any uh, land needs assessment notion of necessity. So we have to wait and see. What, what's your forecast about this contest between capacity and and uh, perceived necessity, vis-a-vis what the what the province might do, have they have they shrugged? Have they have they said anything? Yes. So the the, the province is the approval authority for uh, ROPA forty nine, and that has been forwarded to uh, the, the the Ministry of Municipal Affairs, who are currently reviewing it. Um, I can say that uh, as of uh, this week, they have deemed it complete. Uh, so uh, they have all of the information that they need to uh, to commence their review. Um, the minister can make a decision on it. Um, the minister can also uh, refer it to the uh, Ontario Land Tribunal. Uh, that, that, that could be a, a possibility. Uh, but, but we're confident in the work that we've done. We're confident in the uh, land needs assessment uh, as it relates to the fact that uh, we have land uh, available to accommodate our growth to 2041. Um, staff um, have a lot of confidence in, in, in that work and a lot of confidence in the framework uh, that was developed uh, to enable council uh, to, to see how intensification and densification is occurring over time um, as an input to good decision making. Well, yeah, I, I I love the note of optimism there, and and I share it. Uh, Councillor Fogel, Jane, um, um, maybe uh, it would be good to give people an idea of the quality of the farmland that that we worked so hard to save here. Like, this is not this is not some abstract theoretical idea, right? 
Uh, absolutely. Uh, the, the soils have all been studied in, in and in fact, across the whole GTA, uh, and they're they're all pretty much class one and class two, as as good as it gets. And it's based on the soil type and the heat units and the you get the best. And uh, can you still hear me? I say internet well, unstable. Uh, it, it's been a, a miraculous. You've you've faded down a little bit, but not out completely. Oh, okay. And so, so that land you could make out what you were saying. Okay, you, so you, it's the you, best as it could be. And, and we talk about highest and best use of land, and it never seems to be that that's farmland. But now I think we can see that it is becoming the highest and best use of the farmland is to keep it as farmland to protect us into the future as climate change certainly makes farming worldwide more precarious. Uh, and I think it's great that we're going out to 2041 because it, gives us an opportunity to look at or to think about the world at 2041. When you plan from, from now out to 2051, it's like, oh, continuous as if it's going to be the same. But that's not the case now. We know 2041 is going to be different. And we need to prepare ourselves for it and protect this, this farmland. And it's a, real, it's a crime, practically, that the other regions have not taken the same attitude. It's just 9,000 acres in York. Uh, on June the 30th, they approved. It's terrible. I think. Uh, I, I, I would also add that that, that uh, the the Ontario Federation of Agriculture, the Ontario Farmland Trust, uh, the Halton Region Federation of Agriculture are all saying protect the farmland, if not permanently, for as long as uh, possible. The farmers know that it's valuable and they want to keep it that way. That and that was really startling and and welcome news because there have been previous years where. It appeared sometimes that farmers wanted their last crop to be houses, and uh, I th and you mentioned York. I think Peel uh, expanded into was it eleven thousand acres? Yeah. So so yeah, um, uh, Kurt on the uh, on the, uh, the the farmland issue. Um, what is the what's the state of play on this mapping question about the farmland and the state of protection? that it's going to have. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. The um, yeah, uh, central to an official plan is a map uh, with land use designations that link back to policies. And, and we have uh, some fairly robust mapping that has been done uh, on the basis of you know some of the um, the information, the detailed information that Councillor Fogel had referenced with respect to you know soils mapping and heat mapping. So um, in our in our current plan, uh, we identify um, agriculture um, and and we identify the fact that we have a natural heritage system. And so um, the uh, the mapping uh, exercise that we have underway right now. Um, we are working with landowners to ensure that we're you know, um, getting those uh, areas right uh, with respect to um, those land use designations and overlays, uh, in particular on the, the natural heritage side. Uh, we have a, a, a wealth of, of data that we use to uh, you know, draw those, uh, you know, the, those boundaries. Um, but but there also there has been a, a bit of a change from a provincial policy perspective on uh, what should be or could be a designation versus an overlay. And I, I don't know that I want to get uh, too technical uh, here, but um, they're, they're, they're different uh, typologies, I guess, of, of, of the map. And, and, and they do have slightly different meaning. A designation is a, a little bit more uh, indicative of the principle of the long long term land use that's intended for for that area where an overlay you know provides a, a little bit of uh, what I'd say guidance or advice in terms of how um, those lands would be treated over time. So um, that, that that's very much a live exercise. We're we're quite interested in hearing from folks um, uh, with respect to our our mapping approach. So can I uh, pr understand that correctly? If I think of the overlays as sort of a guideline and the designations is more of a code to to make my favorite riff off of the Pirates of the Caribbean movie. Yes, Mr. Mayor, the, uh, the, the, the overlays do still 
merit or have the weight of of the policy behind them. Uh, and and so it's not just a guideline. They're, they um, they are implemented by staff as having the weight of a designation. I think in in some cases it is it's a distinction, but it's it's almost a, a distinction without a difference. Um, and a, as you know. Um, you know, I, I think central in the rural area, we, we want to protect farmland, uh, but we also want to protect our natural heritage uh, system as, as being important. And and sometimes our objectives for natural heritage and our objectives for, for agriculture and for farming don't always line up. And so uh, we want to make sure that we're striking the right balance there. Yeah. Well, Tim, in your long years of uh, working with the cities, uh, and uh, let me footnote for Oakville viewers. Oakville is a city that calls itself a town and feels like a village, as Harry Barrett taught me to say. Uh, Harry was the mayor from 72 to 85, so that saying goes back a ways, and Oakville was a lot smaller when he used to say it. But Tim, the cities um, that you've worked with over the last 25 years, it seems to me that a big change has happened. I don't think we used to plan so far out in the future. My recollection when I first began paying attention was the time horizon was more like 10 years or, or anyway, some way shorter thing than 30 years. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I think, um, you know, the, the government um, in this round, provincial government, you know, changed the rules to require uh, planning for a much longer time horizon. Um, you know, the cynic in me says so that, uh, you know, massive land grabs could be facilitated through the regional official plans as quickly as possible, therefore rewarding lots of speculative uh, developers. Um, you know, they would say that they were doing it to plan long term for housing needs. I think one of the complexities uh, around trying to do planning uh, for 30 years out in a place like the Greater Golden Horseshoe in a time of massive economic and climate change is that it, it's really, really hard to uh, predict what the needs are going to be, you know, that far out. Um, in particular, if some of the things that you are all trying to do around densification, building new housing types, building with inside of cities, if those are successful, and the market seems to be telling us that they are, and that people prefer that approach to development, then a lot of the projections around housing need that are based on past consumption of land, past land use, past housing types, are bound to be very wrong. And uh, so I think these very long-term projections out of 30 years are, are pretty fraught. Um, so I think you have to really take them with a, a, a grain of salt. Uh, and in particular in Southern Ontario, we don't have uh, a lot of room to grow. I mean, I think Canadians are under this illusion a lot of the time that because we live in this very large country, that we don't have to worry about gobbling up land because we can just keep doing it forever. You know, we've got 6 million square kilometers of it. But if you look at Southern Ontario, and Jane flagged this very uh, aptly, we have very uh, small amounts of very high quality farmland. In fact, Southern Ontario, you should think of it more as Europe, um, and where you know they've made the decisions there not to expand their boundaries ever. In fact, I have a really good friend whose family uh, uh, got land back that was taken from them uh, after the war in Germany, former East Germany. And when the wall came down, they got all this farmland back. And uh, we were traveling around visiting it. And uh, I said, well, this must be worth a, a bundle, all of this farmland just outside of Leipzig. He says it's worth only the rents that the farmers will pay because it has no speculative value. The boundaries will never be expanded. And I think that um, you know, we need to think that way, is that we cannot afford to gobble up our remaining farmland with urban sprawl. We have to do better inside of our existing cities and uh, make them better places to live with affordable housing. And I think the, the Halton plan and the Hamilton plans really do this. And uh, the York plan, by the way, I think is illegal. And uh, the minister is going to have to reject it because they're proposing to build on the Oak Ridge of Moraine, which is illegal. So, um, you know, I think Halton and, uh, and Hamilton have clearly conformed to the rules that, that the province has set out. Some of the other regions, not so much. And, you know, we can speculate on what some of the reasons for that are, but the plans are clearly not sustainable. Yeah. So, Kurt, in your experience, the time horizon for planning, has it in fact, I mean, do I remember it correctly? Did it used to be uh, shorter, like 10 years and and then 20 and now 30? Yeah, yes, typically it's it's 10 to 20. Um, there there were there have been provisions uh, that were added to the provincial policy statement, uh, for example, a few years back that suggest, you know, municipalities can go beyond the 20 year time frame for planning for 
big ticket infrastructure projects, just recognizing the the time and the complexity to, to get those projects underway. But, uh, you know, uh, land use planning and growth management purposes, it's, you know, typically between 10 and 20 years is standard. Mm. Well, it's fascinating. You know, the, the most extraordinary thing that I see as mayor of Oakville is that, uh, uh, we actually have applications for more than we can let people build because of infrastructure limitations that are too complicated to get into uh, here. But uh, it is remarkable to see how hot the demand is to live in Oakville in these new intensified uh, ways of living. So uh, there is hope for farmland if you look if you look around here, uh, I think. And uh, uh, I gather that. Um, uh, Jane, that in Georgetown, uh, you're doing some grow. Are you doing some growing up? I, I hear that you're doing a little bit of growing up, uh, so to speak, uh, yeah. rather than out. Yeah, yes, we are. We have our applications for intensification, and uh, we look forward to getting the lake-based water so that we can uh, continue to grow in, in the uh, older parts of town and along the, uh, the corridors. Oh, yeah. And uh, the entire region came together, all four local municipalities to support that. And uh, uh, how soon do you think it'll get there? I mean, I can see it under construction uh, up, up the road from here. Maybe if you're frozen, Kurt can tell us how soon uh, you're going to get the lake base uh, supply. Kurt, why don't you uh, see if you can answer that? Yeah, yes, Ms. The, uh Yeah, it is under construction indeed. Um, it'll be another couple of years before um, the the, uh, the trunk water main and uh, sewer uh, can be commissioned, but uh, everything seems to be uh, on schedule. So. Well, there you go, Jane. Good news for uh, you and the and the local residents who yeah. Who just try to... try driving up Trafalgar Road right now. <laughs> it's terrible, but that's what's happening. What's, what's your best detour? No, no, we don't have time. Uh, <laughs> thank you, everybody, for this. Uh, I hope this helps uh, you, and I thank you for watching, uh, to understand uh, what's been done, how historic it is, and, uh, and what it means for a more livable future for all of us. Uh, as you know, the COVID uh, pandemic has taught us food matters, and we might want to keep a little bit of farmland around. Uh, please let me know uh, that if there's anything that you'd like us to cover on this show, mayor at oakville.ca. Thanks for being with us. Bye-bye.